Britain, summer and summer holidays are always synonymous with that very popular activity, eating out of doors. Nothing could be better than an open field, a picnic hamper, something gutsy to eat, a bottle of chilled white wine and some good healthy outdoor appetites. Well, it's one thing eating out of doors, but it's even better if you actually do the cooking out of doors because there's nothing more evocative than the smell of sizzling food cooking over charcoal. Now, for me, barbecues used to be a bit of a hit and miss affair with lighting the coals until I discovered this, which is barbecue fuel, which comes in a bag. And what you do is you just set light to the bag. You put it in the tray, set light to it like this, and then it takes about half an hour for the paper to burn and the coals to become hot and that gives you plenty of time to go off to the kitchen and prepare the food. Right, and the first thing I want to show you to cook on the barbecue is a real proper authentic hamburger. When you make it properly, I think it's hard to beat. And I want to show you how to do that. You start off first of all with one pound of steak. Now this is four quarter meat, it's actually chuck and blade steak and it's the best kind of steak to have because it's got roughly 20% fat in it and we actually need that for a hamburger because you're not going to eat it but it acts as a sort of internal basting and keeps the hamburger juicy whilst it's on the coals and this is going to be enough for two people because these are called half a pounders they're adult hamburgers hamburgers are things that are often sort of just minced meat mi onions you know people don't really bother much but when you actually make it carefully and properly I think it's better than eating expensive steak much better so now it's gone into my um, food processor in chunks and now I'm just going to switch it on and chop it with a sort of on and off movement now you don't want it to be too fine. If you make it into a puree, you'll find the hamburger tastes bouncy. So that's right, you just need it sort of roughly chopped like that. And um, what this does, the chopping, is it tenderizes the meat. And I'm just going to add a little bit of uh, freshly milled pepper to it. No salt, because salt draws out the juices and we want to keep the juices in. Now this has got to be divided equally into two burgers. You can do it on the scales if you want to be accurate or you can guess as I'm doing now. So because it's chopped, it's tenderized. And that's why I love real hamburgers because they give you all the things that you sometimes get disappointed in in a steak. Sometimes a steak is tough, sometimes it's dry. And with a hamburger, it's always tender and it's always juicy. So there we are, there's one. No egg in it, no onions, just pure meat. And here comes the other one. And you'll find, you know, it adheres together quite easily. You don't need anything to bind it with. And then they're going to be ready to go on the hot charcoal. What you do is just cover them when you've made them, however many you want to make, half a pound per person, remember. Keep them in the refrigerator until you're ready to serve them. Now, I think the best vegetable to go on the barbecue is this one here. This is sweet corn. Now what I wanted to be able to do with the sweet corn was cut it into chunks and barbecue it, but it's so difficult to cut. I think you need a hacksaw or something. So what I'm going to do is cook it on the cob and then cut it hopefully in chunks afterwards. Now, just put a little bit of oil. You see, you can, can prepare these in advance. Just put a little bit of oil on and brush it round. Olive oil I'm using here. And I don't know whether any of you have ever been to Turkey, but they cook these on the streets, street sellers, and the smell of the corn on the charcoal is so um, magnificent. Always gives you an instant appetite. A little bit of pepper and salt on there, and then that's all ready to go on the barbecue later on. Now, in the supermarket, you can buy lots of good relishes to go with hamburgers and barbecued um, food, but I want to show you a homemade um, recipe which is called a Mexican tomato salsa and I think this goes particularly well with all barbecued food. Now you start off with four large tomatoes that'll be enough for four to six people and they need to be good firm tomatoes you skin them and then you chop them in half like that 
Then take a plate or a bowl and lift the half of the tomato over the bowl, that's why it needs to be firm, and give it a squeeze. And then you'll find as you squeeze it, most of the seeds will drop out. And then any that are left, you can just push out with your hands or use a teaspoon. And then that's ready to be chopped. So you do that the same with the other half. And then you chop the tomato finely, like this tomato here. There it is, all finely chopped, ready to go into the bowl for the salsa. And the next ingredient is this, which is red onion, half a red onion chopped. And then this one here, which is fresh coriander, two tablespoons of fresh coriander this time. And then the juice of a lime. And then the last rather Mexican ingredient is a chilli. I want to show you this chilli because it's one of the sort of triangular squat shaped chilies, which isn't fiery hot. This won't burn your mouth out. It'll give a nice piquancy. And you treat it the same way as you would a pepper by just cutting it in half like that and taking out the seeds. Now, even though this isn't a fiery pepper, you have to be very careful. American recipes always tell you when you're preparing chilies to wear rubber gloves. Now, I haven't quite got round to that, but I will give you a word of warning. As soon as you've cut the chilli, the next thing you must do is go and wash your hands. Because if you accidentally rub your eye with chilli on, with chilli seeds rather, on your hands, you'll find um, it'll be very, very sore. Now, some people like salsa really hot, so you could put two chilies in if you wanted to. Or what I do is I find after it's um, been left aside for an hour and the flavours have developed, I taste it, and if I think it needs a bit more of a kick, I just add a few drops of Tabasco sauce. So there's our chilli. That's going to go in and join the rest of the ingredients. And then we need some salt and some freshly milled pepper. And the lovely thing about salsa is that it doesn't have very many calories. It's one of those sauces that you can serve and uh, feel, not feel guilty about because it hasn't got a lot of calories in it. There we are. Cover it with cling film. Leave it for about an hour for the flavours to develop or longer if you want to. And if a lot of juice comes out of it, you can just drain the juice off before serving it. So I think you'll like that Mexican tomato salsa. Now, if you're having nice, fat, juicy hamburgers out in the garden, it's quite nice to serve some potatoes with them. And I like to oven roast potatoes with garlic and rosemary because that gives a nice gutsy flavour. Now, for four to six people, you start off with two pounds of potatoes. You cut them up, wash them, scrub them, leave the skins on and cut them up. And then after you've cut them, dry them very thoroughly in a cloth because to get them nice and crisp, they need to be as dry as possible. Now these are the potatoes, so you can see the shape that I've cut them up in, little chunky pieces like that. And they're nice and dry. And they're going to go into hot olive oil, which is preheated in the oven. The oven is turned to gas mark seven or the equivalent. And you pop a roasting tin in with some oil to get it nice and hot before the potatoes go in to join it. So we'll get that out now. Now, when you take it out, you put it over, I've got the heat on already here, over direct heat so that the fat stays really hot when the potatoes hit it. That's another important part of roasting potatoes. So you need to have a good, strong roasting tray. So we'll put them in now. It's very difficult to buy a shallow roasting tray like this. So what I'm using, actually, is the direct oven shelf. This seems to work very well for roasting. Now I'm going to put um, one to two tablespoons of rosemary, because you need lots of flavour. It's amazing how when you eat things out in the open air, you really do need to have these strong flavours, and two, one or two cloves of garlic. Now just keep turning that around in the fat so that the potatoes get nice and coated and glistening with oil. And then they go back onto the highest shelf in the oven. 
and they'll take about half an hour to 40 minutes to become nice and crisp and crunchy. Now, we've got some in the oven that have had about half an hour now, so we'll have a look at those. There we go. Shut the oven door. All that needs to happen to those now is they need some crushed rock salt, some freshly milled pepper and a little bit of parsley and more rosemary to make them look pretty. Now I want to show you a salad dressing to go on a salad for a barbecue. This is a blue cheese dressing. First you'll need quite a gutsy blue cheese like Danish blue or if you feel like splashing out rock for here. Either way it needs to be crumbled into small pieces. Then combine a teaspoon of salt with a large clove of garlic and blend to a creamy paste. After that add a rounded teaspoon of mustard powder and some freshly milled black pepper and work these into the paste. Now add a tablespoon of balsamic vinegar, a tablespoon of lemon juice and two tablespoons of light olive oil. Then mix everything well. Now, in a bowl, combine two tablespoons of mayonnaise with a quarter of a pint of soured cream. Into this, whisk the dressing ingredients. Finally, add two chopped spring onions and then the blue cheese and mix well. After you've dressed the salad, sprinkle it with some crunchy croutons just as a nice finishing touch. Okay, well now we're back to the sweet corn and the half pounders. And you can just see, sitting on the coals there, how lovely and juicy that is. And um, just about ready to serve, I think. And don't forget, before cooking hamburgers, to brush them and the grill lightly with oil to prevent them sticking. Right, so now we're moving from an American style barbecue to an Eastern style barbecue. And what I'm doing here is roasting some spices. And I've got one teaspoon of coriander seeds here, one teaspoon of cumin seeds, or cumin seeds, however you like to pronounce them. And you just put them in a little saucepan over a medium heat for a minute or so, minute or two, until they begin to change colour and you get this lovely aroma beginning to drift up. It's a little bit of extra trouble, but it's really worth it. Never, never buy ready ground spices because they so quickly you lose their flavour. And if you buy them whole, like these, and just go through the dry roasting bit, it's really worth it for all that extra aroma and flavour. Now I'm just crushing them up here with a pestle and mortar to a fine powder. And the recipe we're going to make is spiced lamb and cashew kebabs and the spices now are going over to join three quarters of a pound of neck fillet of lamb which I've got in the food processor here and like the hamburgers you need a cut of meat that's got a fair amount of fat in it and so it's also an economical one but you need to make them nice and juicy. Then along with the spices and the meat I'm going to add the cashew nuts and I've got four ounces of roasted cashew nuts and they're going to be followed by some coriander leaves, about three tablespoons of whole coriander leaves, and then a small onion, chopped, roughly, a clove of garlic, which can go in whole like that, and this is a chilli, which I prepared um, the same way that I showed you. Now the liquid I'm going to be putting in is just half the juice of a lime, and then they're going to need quite a bit of salt and a little bit of um, pepper, not too much pepper. And then we're going to start blending it. You 
You might have to stop and start this a few times just to get it exactly to the right consistency. Um, and then you take, first of all, take the blade out. Mustn't um, leave that in. Take the blade out and then take handfuls of the mixture about the size of an egg. I'm going to take two lots. And then what you need to do, we're going to make them into sausages, or sausage shapes rather. What you need to do is sort of press the mixture well together with your hands so that it all is fairly evenly bound. And then put it on a flat surface and roll it into a sausage shape. And you can start off with um, one hand and then you move on to using two hands. You want it fairly thin and quite long. If they're too fat, they take too long to cook on the barbecue. When you've got a sausage shape like that, just square off the ends a bit. And we'll just do the other one. This is a recipe I have tried to copy from a restaurant. I had a holiday in Hong Kong and went to a restaurant called Spices in Repulse Bay in Hong Kong. And I had this, and when I came back, I thought it was so delicious, I thought I've got to try and make them. And I think I'm, I have to go back someday and see if I've got anywhere near it or not. Now, they are going to go onto a skewer. And let me tell you that when you use skewers on a barbecue, you must have flat skewers like this. If you have round ones, you get into terrible trouble, because when you try to turn the kebab over, everything sort of spins round, and flat ones make it slightly easier. So now what I'm going to do is just carefully slide that onto the skewer, the first one. And then I'm going to slide the other one on to follow it. You'll get 10 altogether out of that mixture, so you'll need five skewers. Well, what's going to happen to those now is you carefully put them onto a plate Cover them, put them in the refrigerator until you're ready to put them onto the hot coals. And now I want to show you the fastest sauce in the world. And that's called sweet pepper and coriander relish. The ingredients are very, very colourful and they're all assembled here ready to go into my food processor. First of all, half a chilli this time and then a sweet red pepper that's been de-seeded and roughly chopped and then roughly four tablespoons of fresh coriander leaves. And then here I've got two large tomatoes, and these, these have been seeded and roughly chopped. And then lastly, a lovely bright colourful red onion. And then the liquid I'm using is going to be four tablespoons of lime juice. That can be about one and a half limes to two limes, four tablespoons. And then we need some salt and some freshly milled pepper. All the ingredients are raw in this sauce and there's no fat in it, so it must be quite good for you. Now we're going to blend it in the blender until it becomes a relish. Now for those of you who don't have food processors, everything I've done today can be done through an old-fashioned mincer with a handle. It's just if you've got a food processor, you can make the fastest sauce in the world a bit quicker. Now uh, what I'm going to do with there is just give it one final burst with the bits around the edge that have got stuck. There it is. It needs to be not a puree but just just chopped up as you can see the texture here I'll just take the blade out first um, not a puree but just a sort of chopped relish and that's delicious with any kind of barbecue food it's lovely with the kebabs that we've just made but you can serve it with good old bangers if they're good quality and it tastes really good so there we are spicy char grilled oriental kebabs but here's a barbecue glaze that's very popular with children Take two halved apricots, two tablespoons of dark brown sugar, two fluid ounces of Worcester sauce and the same amount of light soy sauce. Add two tablespoons of tomato puree, a level tablespoon of grated root ginger, 
a teaspoon of powdered ginger, a sprinkling of pepper and a clove of garlic. Sprinkle in a few drops of Tabasco and then whiz it all together. Then just baste your choice of meat and add it to the barbecue. This really is a wonderful combination of flavours. In fact, it's the best barbecue sauce I've ever come across. I very often hear complaints from people who go to barbecues saying there's always very little on offer for people who don't actually eat any meat. Well, if you get oily fish like sardines, they work very, very well on a barbecue. Stuff some herbs in the centre, and here I've got a lovely sort of barbecue griller, which is very easy because you can turn them over. If you don't actually eat any meat or fish, there's another lovely recipe for the barbecue. This is cubes of halloumi cheese, which have been marinated in oil and herbs overnight and then threaded onto skewers. Well, if the weather's really warm and sunny, I think one of the nicest meals to eat out of doors is the classic English afternoon tea. Now, this can be quite an elegant, dainty affair, but once a year, I have to provide something a little bit more substantial for my husband and 24 other cricketers. What we need to do here is provide something that tastes really good, but is relatively simple to prepare. No trying to cut crumbly cakes into slices at the last minute. And creamy things are no good either, because if the weather's warm, they just melt and turn sour. This year, I made some medium-sized American-style muffins, which I must say were very popular. But when I'm making muffins for myself at home, I like to make the mini muffins. And what I'd like to do now is show you a recipe for muffins. We're going to make mini ones, but you can make whatever size you like, which I'll explain later on. Now, you start off with a nice big mixing bowl like this. And the first ingredient is two ounces of melted butter. And then to the melted butter, I'm going to add an egg, and this is a size 2 egg. And then I've got some sugar here. One and a half ounces of caster sugar, this is. And the um, muffins I'm going to make are fresh apricot and pecan nut. And they're going to have half a teaspoonful of vanilla extract and then half a teaspoon of cinnamon, which I always think goes very well with apricots and pecans. Half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Now, you go into that with a whisk and just whisk it all together to amalgamate it thoroughly. Now I'm going to add four fluid ounces of milk and that just gets whisked into the rest. And the dry ingredients are over in my bowl next to me here. This is two and a half ounces of whole wheat flour and two and a half ounces of plain white flour. And it's been sifted once and now it's going to get sifted again. Muffins are terribly, terribly light to eat. And I think one of the reasons they're so light is because they get um, a double sifting with the flour. And with the flour, very important, I'm going to put in half a tablespoon, this is the raising agent, half a tablespoon of baking powder and there's a quarter of a teaspoon of salt in there as well. It's lovely to be able to show you how to make muffins because they really are so very, very easy to make. They can be whisked up in seconds. And keep the, keep the um, sieve up quite high so the flour gets a good airing as it goes down. And then because I've got half whole wheat here, there's a little bit of bran in the, in the sieve there, so that gets, goes in last. And if you don't want to use whole wheat flour, you can just use all plain flour. You can make muffins and muffins, and then you can decide which ones you like best, which flavours, which flours. They're so easy to make. Right, now I'm just going to take a, a tablespoon and start to fold the dry ingredients into the wet ingredients. And I have to tell you here, don't be tempted to whisk or beat. All you do is just fold the flour into the liquid ingredients and what happens is as you do that you can see it looks a total disaster. It's all lumpy and you think my goodness wow I must have done something wrong but that's the wonder of television. I can show you Instead of having to just write it, I can actually show you that that nasty, lumpy mixture is absolutely correct. That's how it should look. Once all the flour has been folded in, we're going to add the 
apricots and pe pecans. And they're waiting over here. Four ounces of apricots that have been stoned, chopped, quite small. One ounce of pecan nuts, and these have been lightly toasted under the grill. Now they just get folded in, in exactly the same way. It's so much nicer than making fairy cakes. I think this recipe must be death to fairy cakes. When you've got to cream the butter and the sugar and add the milk little by uh, the egg and milk little by little in case it curdles, no problem. With muffins, they're just dead simple. Now over here, I've got a muffin baking tray, a mini one. And inside, it's got little mini muffin cases. Now, if you can get hold of the cases, it's much better because it keeps them fresher. But if not, you can just grease the inside well and you can cook them straight in. Now, what you need to do is take heaped teaspoonfuls of the mixture over to the cases. And the mixture's got to sort of just come up to the top of the papers. You mustn't fill them too full, otherwise they, they spill over. The ideal shape, I believe, for a mini muffin is it should look like a champagne cork. So if you can imagine what a champagne cork looks like. Um, and then you preheat the oven to gas mark six or the equivalent, and they will take 20 to 25 minutes to bake. Well, now I want to show you what some baked muffins look like, and I've got rather a lot here to show you. First of all, that little champagne cork shape of the mini muffin there. And then here I've got a whole arrangement of muffins that are medium-sized, or man-sized, I like to call them. These here have got sugar crusting on the top and a few nuts, and inside they've got the same that we just made. Or you can use those to ring the changes with a cinnamon icing and put a pecan half on top. These at the end here are the classic American blueberry muffins, and they're particularly nice because the blueberries sort of swell up and burst in the oven while they're cooking, and so they're nice and sort of squidgy to eat, which is extra specially nice. Now, over here, I've got mini muffins iced with cinnamon icing and topped with a pecan, and next door, I've got coffee. These are coffee and walnut with a coffee icing, and even more down here, these are chocolate, chocolate chip, Next door to those are carrot and um, walnut. And in the centre there, very nice for the summer especially, um, lemon muffins with lemon icing and, and lemon grated lemon on the top. Now, if you don't want to make muffins, you can still make that lovely easy mixture, put it into a cake tin and put a crumble topping and you'll get muffin cake. This is blueberry muffin cake, that's specially good. Well, I think that's all about muffins now, and it's all about outdoor eating and outdoor cooking. But I hope you're going to come back next time when I'm going to be doing bright meals for those rainy summer days. So I look forward to seeing you then. totally amazed that even when the weather's as bad as it is now, there are some British people who are determined to be out of doors. But not me. I'm hot foot back to the kitchen now to make some bright, spicy meals to cheer myself up. Well, 
One way I think to brighten a dull day is to go oriental and make something spicy. And I've got a lovely recipe to show you, first of all. This one's for a Thai red curry paste, which is here. And um, if you're the kind of person who likes making spicy food and making your own blends of curry powders, I think you'll really like this one. It's something different, but it's really good. Now, it's made from all these ingredients that I've got spread out before me here. First of all, lemongrass, which larger supermarkets and oriental shops have. And you need four pieces trimmed about here. Six lovely big fat cloves of garlic. Four shallots. This is fresh root ginger here, and you use two teaspoons of this grated. Four teaspoons of hot paprika. And then I've got four medium-sized red chilies. This is where it gets its name from, red curry paste. The juice of two limes, and the spices are four teaspoons of coriander seeds and two teaspoons of cumin seeds. And these have been dry roasted the way we did on the barbecue program. And then everything is going to be just put in the food processor and processed to make this lovely curry paste here. And the curry paste can be used in lots of ways. First of all, I want to show you how to make Thai fish cakes. They're not authentic Thai fish cakes, they're Delia Thai fish cakes, but they're very good. And you start off in your food processor with a pound of white fish, any kind of fish that hasn't got any skin, you know, the skinless white fish you buy in the supermarket. And then to that, I'm going to add some spring onion and I want all the green bit as well. So I'm just going to add um, the spring onions just roughly chopped. And then I'm going to add some coriander, fresh coriander, about two tablespoons of coriander. And this is a chilli here. This has been de-seeded. And remember, if you're dealing with chilies, you've either got to use rubber gloves or wash your hands immediately afterwards because they can make you sting. Now some lime juice, a tablespoon of lime juice. And then we need some salt. Good seasoning of salt. And I'm going to use two tablespoons, quite heaped tablespoons of curry paste. And then all that just gets whizzed up together to make the fish cakes. Off we go. You want everything fairly coarsely chopped up. But not too fine. It mustn't go too fine, otherwise the fish cakes are tough. That's just about right, I think, there, yes. And this now gets transferred to a bowl. We'll remove the blade, first of all. And we're just going to make 16 altogether, 16 fish cakes, which is enough for a first course for four people. And they're quite tiny, these fish cakes, just about a dessert spoonful. And what you do is take it in your hand like that and keep squeezing. You'll find quite a bit of liquid comes out of it. That doesn't matter. You just keep on squeezing. And as you keep on squeezing like this, the mixture will, will come together and it'll be easy to shape the fish cake. You just shape it like that into a small round fish cake. Now you can do all this in advance and then when, you, when you're ready to cook the fish cakes you have some hot oil in a frying pan. This is ground nut oil or um, sometimes called peanut oil and you have it nice and hot in the frying pan and then you add the fish cakes and you just give them one minute's cooking on each side. Very important not to overcook them. They really only need one minute each side, otherwise they get a little bit dry, and we don't want that to happen. They should be nice and juicy. And then I want to show you a very nice sauce to serve with them. And this is my version of an oriental dipping sauce. And here are all the ingredients. It's made in the food processor exactly the same as before. One tablespoon of dark brown sugar, one tablespoon of roasted peanuts, and these can be salted two inches of cucumber with the skin left on, a small carrot, a chilli de-seeded, a small piece of ginger, and two shallots. Now they go into the processor and you process them to chop them nice and small. And then you add this, which is um, rice vinegar, four fluid ounces of rice vinegar, and some soy sauce, a tablespoon of soy sauce. 
And here's the finished dipping sauce here, which is nice and crunchy textured and very light and, of course, very little calories and just the thing for the fish cakes. Another way of using red curry paste is as a marinade for chicken breasts. Then bake them in the oven and serve them with this wonderful fresh coriander chutney. And now here's an East meets West recipe for Thai red curry prawns served with angel hair pasta. There are 24 large prawns here and you begin by stirring them into four tablespoons of red curry paste. Then cover with cling film and chill for a couple of hours so that they can soak up all the flavours. Now sauté five chopped cloves of garlic in two tablespoons of light oil and add two large skinned, de-seeded and chopped tomatoes and the zest of a lime. Now mix the juice of the lime with seven fluid ounces of white wine and add this to the mixture and reduce for about eight minutes. Now the prawns and their paste can go in, give it all a good stir and reduce the heat. Cook for another three minutes so that you let the prawns warm through thoroughly. Meanwhile, plunge six ounces of angel hair pasta into a large saucepan of boiling salted water. And after three minutes, serve the pasta straight into warmed bowls. Spoon the prawns and the sauce over and garnish with a little fresh chopped coriander. Finally, add a thin slice of lime and this will serve two as a main course or four as a starter. Well, now we're going to go on a long journey all the way from Thailand to Sri Lanka. And I want to show you a curry recipe that a friend of mine brought back from there. The main ingredient for this curry is this here, which is a fresh coconut. Now, fresh coconuts look a bit forbidding. They're not exactly user friendly, but they're much easier to deal with than you might think. First thing you do is pierce the little holes in the top there and drain out the coconut milk to use later on. Then the next thing you need is a polythene bag. You put the coconut inside the polythene bag. Then you need a really heavy object, something like a big hammer or a mallet and a piece of concrete. And then you put the coconut onto the concrete like that. Hold onto the polythene bag and then give as big a smash as you can manage. Have you got your fingers crossed? There we are, wasn't that difficult, was it? So there we are, one cracked coconut. Now we've got to get it away from the shell. And the way to do this, sometimes if the coconut's quite dry, it just comes away automatically. Sometimes it, if it's a bit moist, it clings. And what you have to do is you have to take a sharp knife, dig the knife in at the tip like that, of where the coconut's broken, and just keep sliding the knife in right underneath and then it'll just prise it away like that. And then when you've prized it away, you'll find it's got another layer of skin. And so what you do is take either a sharp knife or a potato peeler and you just slide off the skin under the blade of the potato peeler like that until it's all peeled and you have nice clean pieces of coconut. Well, in fact, they won't be that clean because they get a bit dirty. So what you need to do is, after you've taken that layer of skin off, take all the pieces of coconut to the running tap, give them a good rinse so they become nice and clean. And then you've got the grating of the coconut to do. This recipe is going to have grated coconut in it, and there are two ways to grate coconut. The first way is the hard way, by hand, but it's not that hard really. You take the coconut to the medium blade of the grater, and grate it, what could be simpler really, is just that it does take a little bit of time. It's like when you chop up marmalade peel for making marmalade. I mean, some of these little jobs do take time, but sit down, relax, and put the radio on, listen to some nice music, and I have timed it. I've timed it, and it takes about just over eight minutes to grate one whole coconut. That's if you do it that way. But you can make even shorter work of it if you happen to own a food processor. And if you do, you can get an attachment blade like this, which will um, coarsely grate it in seconds for you. It's quite useful having that blade, especially if you want to grate 
hard Parmesan cheese, you know, you want a large amount. Anyway, what you do is you put the lid on and you put the coconut into the feeding hole at the top here. And then you just take this little instrument which pushes it down and then switch on and watch the whole thing happen in seconds. Here we go. There we are, that does make light work of it. Now, over here, I've got the contents of one whole coconut, finely grated, and I'm going to use half of it later to show you another recipe, but now I'm going to take this half and show you how to make Sri Lankan curry. Now, I start off here with some spices, and I've got here a teaspoonful of a spice called fenugreek. Now, sometimes you can only buy this ready ground, and if that's all you can get, that's all right. And here I've got six whole green cardamom pods. And I'm just going to crush the cardamom pods up with the seeds, the fenugreek. And this is going to form part of the spices for the curry. I always leave the pods on the cardamoms because I think they give a lovely fragrant flavour. And then I've got another spice here. I've got an inch of whole cinnamon stick. Now, over on the stove in my cooking pot, I've got two large onions, and these have just been softening and turning golden in some ground nut oil. And I'm going to add the spices to the onions, and the heat in the pan will just begin to draw their flavour out. And then the other spice I've got, or blend, is good old curry powder. This is Madras curry powder, and I'm going to use a tablespoonful. Now, this is not a hot curry. I'd, I'd call it a medium to mild curry, this one. And I think that's quite nice, really, because if you have too much heat, sometimes it masks all the lovely flavours of the spices. Now you get, begin to get a lovely aroma coming out of the pan, which is wonderful and very, very appetising. Now, the meat for the curry is actually lamb, but you can use beef if you want. This is neck of lamb, and it's been cubed into little bite-sized cubes, and I've browned it in a pan. I used ground nut oil again and browned the meat um, in batches of about four or five pieces. If you overcrowd the pan when you're, when you're browning meat, you find it creates a lot of steam and it won't brown, and you want it nice and brown and crusty because that's what gives you flavour. So, there we go, one and a half pounds of neck fillet, that is. But of course, braising beef would be just as good. So just turn the meat into the spices, and then the, the whole thing is going to need some thickening. And so I'm going to add at this stage one and a half tablespoons of flour to provide the thickening. Just stir the flour in to soak up the juices. And don't worry what it looks like. It always looks rather grim when the flour goes in, but it's all right. It soon soaks up. And now the liquid we're going to use, out of those three little holes I showed you in the coconut, I drained off the milk inside it, and that's, that's it. And you have to put it through a strainer. So that's going to go in next. And then I've got a pint of stock here. I've got lamb stock, which you buy in tubs from the supermarket. But you can use any stock, vegetable stock. There's a very good veg vegetable stock powder on the market at the moment, um, which I sometimes use if I haven't got any stock. So that's the liquid content. And while that's coming up to simmering point, I'm going to show you another ingredient that you might not have come across. This is creamed coconut. And it comes in packets like this at the supermarket. And um, it's rather like a block of margarine or, or butter. And you keep it in the refrigerator. And when you want to use it, you grate it. And it gives a lovely, creamy, velvety um, flavour and texture to the sauce. And remember to keep it always in the refrigerator, because when you grate it, um, it does sort of melt r rather quickly. And you'll probably see here that this has begun to melt around the edges and turn to a cream. 
There's three ounces of coconut there. And that's going to go in to join the rest. Give it a stir in. And then finally, we're going to add the coconut, the freshly grated coconut. So that goes in next. And then some seasoning of salt, a little bit of freshly milled pepper. And then what we want to do is just bring this up to gentle simmering point and put a lid on and let it simmer very, very gently for two hours um, to draw out all the lovely flavours. Now, if you're one of these people who finds it